commitment lies in my commitment lies in creating a loving, joyful, safe, and nurturing environment for all students, families, and staff members. And so, um, you know, we're really trying to build community and get to know everybody. So I would love to get to know you to see who has joined us today. Um, and we're not gonna go around to ask everyone, but if you can just go into the chat and put your name, your school, if you're part of Bumo Network, and if you're familiar with the Montessori method, um, go on ahead and let me know who's here. Hi, Edna, how are you? Thank you for coming. Hi, Justin. Hi, Tanya from Angelica's Daycare. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Anyone um, familiar with Montessori at all? Dual immersion, love it. Hi, Mia, welcome. Yes, Edna knows Montessori. Yay, I love it. Hi, hi, Anna. Family daycare implement Montessori program. Ooh, nice. Yes, hopefully I can give you some good ideas to implement into your childcare. Perfect. We'll see a couple more. Hi, Natalie. Yay, part of Boomer Network. <laughs> some previous Montessori workshops. Awesome, I love it. Great. Thank you for sharing and please feel free to continue on. Um, hi, Adriana, welcome. <laughs> hi, Alejandro, welcome. Little giant daycare, I love it. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Again, just to continue um, putting those in the chat if you like, and I can get back to it towards the end too. Um, so a little bit of an outline of what this webinar will cover. Uh, understanding Montessori principles, creating a Montessori inspired learning environment, Montessori curriculum integration, um, Montessori materials and techniques, and then we'll have a little Q&A at the end. Um, I did receive some questions prior that I will answer and we'll get to those at the end. So what is Montessori, right? So funny story, when I started ECE, you know, out of, I was in college, I figured out that child development was my thing. And so I, you know, was looking for a job, I needed money. And so I found a job in a Montessori school. And I was like, oh, well, Montessori, I don't know what it was. I had no idea what it was. I honestly thought it was a religion, which surprisingly, a lot of people think that Montessori is a religion for those who don't really know. And I was one of those, I'm like, oh, religion, I have no idea what that's about, but I don't really care because I need a job. And so I went to the interview and come to find out it is not a religion and it's a philosophy and a way of um, and a method. And so I was like, oh, okay, cool. And so as I was working as a teacher assistant, you know, um, I developed a love for it and I pursued on to get my Montessori credentials, became a head teacher and continue to love it, you know? And so what is Montessori, right? Montessori is an education philosophy and practice that fosters rigorous self-motivated growth for children and adolescents. And yes, yeah, surprisingly, it's for children and adolescents. And so I'm not sure if you're aware, but there are Montessori high schools and middle schools. They're very rare. We don't really see them on the West side. It's more Midwest is where we see them. And even at that, there might be like one or two, but they do exist, they, they are out there. And actually one of the schools that I used to work for, we started at infant and went up to fifth grade. So there are some elementaries sprinkled in California, but again, it's very rare. We normally see infant, toddler and preschool. Um, so um, in all areas of their development with the goal of nurturing each child's natural desire for knowledge, understanding and respect. So there are some main principles that are included with this um, within the Montessori method. And so that includes respect of the child's absorbent mind, sensitive periods, educating the whole child, individual, individualized learning, freedom of movement and choice, prepared environment, intrinsic motivation, and independence. So we're going to go through each of these. I'm going to provide you a little bit um, of what that looks like in a Montessori classroom and then provide an example or two of how you can implement that into your, into your classroom. And so respect of the child. Um, Maria Montessori has a lot of famous quotes. And so this is one of them. Children are human beings to whom respect is due, superior to us by reason of their unconscious and of the greater 
or sorry, innocence and of the greater possibilities of their future. And so in a Montessori classroom, respect is, is it, right? It's not just respect of the child, but respect of their family and respect of life. And so much of the Montessori philosophy stems from a deep respect for children. This involves respecting the uniqueness of every child, their freedom to choose, to move, to correct their own mistakes, and to work at their own pace. Montessori educators work and interact with children from a, a place of genuine respect. And so obviously, you know, that's a no brainer, re respecting children um, in the classroom. However, just being mindful of what those ways and, and how we can um, implement those in the classroom. And so one way that we can do it is understand and respect the development stages of your students. You know, you might have a mixed age classroom, um, and not every child is, you know, at the same developmental stage. So as teachers, you know, it's important for us to be mindful that not every child is at the same level and to respect that. In a Montessori classroom, you know, in a traditional Montessori classroom, in a preschool class, it's mixed age groups. So usually it's two to six year olds. And so obviously every child's not on the same developmental stage. They're all different. And so really respecting that and understanding that and providing them activities and materials that helps with the development that they're currently at is helpful. Um, tailoring your teach teaching methods and expectations to align with their cognitive and emotional development. You know, maybe sometimes you're gonna have to um, switch the way you teach for a certain child. Um, maybe you'll have to learn a new technique or a new teaching method to help certain children who are on different developmental levels. So, well, there are some ways in which you can respect the child within the classroom um, that you can implement. And so another principle is the absorbent mind. So Maria Montessori's research determined that the first six years of life are the most crucial in child development. She termed this stage the period of the absorbent mind to describe the child's sponge-like capacity to absorb information from their environment. And pretty much we've all heard, you know, um, during birth and six years of life that a child's brain is like a sponge, right? They absorb everything around them. And so Maria Montessori agreed. And so she called it the absorbent mind. And so during this time, children rapidly develop an understanding of their culture, their world, and construct the foundations of their intelligence and personality. So at, during this age, they're just absorbing everything that they see, whether that's in the environment, whether that's some, that they're being, um, the input that they're receiving from you, you know, they're receiving all of this information and their brain is just absorbing it all. And so some way that we can apply this absorbent mind within the classroom is your environment you know, provide a beautiful and safe, comforting classroom. The absorbent mind depends on being able to draw in useful information from the environment. So if, you, if your classroom is cluttered, dirty, broken materials, not inviting, not engaging, then it's really gonna affect how they're absorbing that information. And so we really wanna make sure that our classrooms are beautiful. Children love beauty. Um, making sure it's beautiful, making sure that they're able to move around, making sure that they're able to, you know, choose material that they want to choose, making sure that it's clean and comforting for them and inviting for them. Um, Student-centered environment. Create a student-centered classroom where students have autonomy over their learning. Allow them to make choices about how they approach assignments or projects within reasonable guidelines. This fosters a sense of ownership. So again, you know, just providing um, a classroom that they're able to choose and do and have control over what, how they want to learn and what they're learning. Um, obviously, you know, you follow a curriculum, right? That you're, you're learning certain things, but allowing them to make choices about how they're going to approach that activity, how they're going to approach whatever it is that you're giving it to them. Um, sensitive periods. So this is another principle. And sensitive periods, Dr. Maria Montessori observed that children pass through specific stages in their development when they are most capable of learning specific knowledge areas and skills. She termed these stages sensitive periods, which essentially describe windows of opportunity for learning. Characteristics of sensitive periods include um, intent, oh, oh, sorry, oh no. Um, so these are her sensitive periods. So she came up with different stages of development, like a lot of our other theorists that we hear, Piaget, Eric Erickson, she had her own um, stages of development and she called them sensitive periods. And so uh, within these periods, we have movement, language, um, uh, order, social interaction. Um, and so, and then all of these 
how can we apply these in our in our classroom, right? And so observation, observation is a huge thing in Montessori. You know, sometimes as teachers we forget just to stop for a minute and watch the classroom and observe the kids. Um, you know, we get too into what's happening and, um, you know, conducting everything, but sometimes you just have to stop for a minute and just watch what the children are doing. Regular observe, regularly observing your students to identify signs of heightened interest and engagement in specific subjects or skills. Look for patterns of curiosity and enthusiasm that align with sensitive periods. So if you see like a child is really interested in tying their shoe, you know, just giving them opportunities to practice that and possibly giving them activities that can help encourage that. Um, flexible curriculum, like I mentioned before, you know, we have a curriculum that we're following. Um, we have a lesson plan that we're doing, but being a little bit flexible on it, you know, and this allows for adjustment based on students evolving interests and developmental stages. Be prepared to modify lessons and activities to accommodate sensitive periods as they arise. So just really being flexible, you know, you don't think that, oh, I have to, I, this week we're learning about apples, it has to be about apple, that's all we can do, you know, but no, it's okay, you can adjust a little bit. I have a student in one of our classes who is fascinated with space, he loves space. And so, uh, you know, I'm already thinking about next week, what, what we should do, because he's going to bring up space. And so he's going to bring up probably the planet or something. And so our theme next week is apples. And so he, we can talk about, oh, you know, this red apple. What, what planet do you think this looks like? Because it's red. What planet's red? You know, just to incorporate his interest within the curriculum. Um, you know, and you can, we, there's some children who are just fascinated about a particular thing. And, you know, try to include that within your curriculum as well. Just, and that helps them to be um, interested and engaged as well. Um, educating the whole child. Montessori education is focused on nurturing each child's potential by providing learning experiences that support their intellectual, physical, emotional, and social development. All aspects of children's development and learning are intertwined and viewed as equally important. So making sure that we're aware of and educating the whole child, you know, making sure that we're supporting physically, emotionally, socially, um, and for me, I think the biggest way and how we can implement this within our classroom is cultural awareness. You know, um, this includes lessons and activities that expose students on to diverse cultures, traditions, and perspectives, promotes tolerance, inclusive, inclusivity, and global awareness through discussions, projects, and literature. And not only can we do this within our classroom, bringing culture into the classroom, but another thing that I think is really important is the material that we have in the classroom. You know, the crayons, for example, a lot of the time in the classrooms, uh, we steer away from the black and brown crayons, you know, um, and we use only the colored crayons, you know, because that's just what we do. And so just making sure that we're incorporating those colors, because they're beautiful colors too. And even not just the crayons, but construction paper, you know, we don't really use a lot of the brown and black construction paper, but we can always encourage students to, let's make a beautiful flower with this black paper, with this brown paper. It doesn't always have to be pink, blue, purple, yellow, you know, let's incorporate those colors as well. Same for paint. I feel like a lot of time, we, the only time that these colors are used is if we're doing um, self-portraits or, mm -hmm. you know, something relating to the skin and body. But, is, but you should include them with everything in any aspect of art. These colors should be included. And that's one way to bring cultural awareness because a child might say, you know, this crayon looks like me. This crayon is the same color as me. Well, let's, well, you're beautiful. So let's make a beautiful flower that looks like you. So making sure we're bringing that cultural awareness in the classroom, I think is super important and can help with educating the whole child as well. Individualized learning. Um, is another principle. And Mon Maria Montessori learned that um, learning programs are personalized to each child based on their unique state of development, interests, and needs. Lessons with Montessori materials are presented one-on-one -on -one based on each child's academic progress. Educators track each child's progress and support them as they progress through curriculum. So, you know, during, um, like I mentioned, in a Montessori classroom, you know, it's mixed age group. So they're all learning different things. And so some, so a lot of the time we do individualized lessons, you know, for example, um, in the math area in a Montessori classroom, you know, it's in a sequence, like all the areas are in a sequence, but particularly for math, um, all the shelves is sequenced. So we start off with sandpaper numbers, you know, sandpaper numbers help children learn how to identify numbers. They also have the sandpaper material on it so they can trace the numbers with their hands. As they're tracing, they know which direction they need to go when it comes to implementing that on paper. 
it's a whole thing. It's amazing. But um, and so after they mastered knowing how to identify numbers, then it's on to quantities. Now, do we know the quantity of these numbers? So we go on to cards and counters, and then we go on to, you know, teams and then on and so forth. You know, there's a pattern, there's a sequence. But for a Montessori classroom, obviously, you know, not every child is going to be at the same level. So we might have one child working on the sandpaper numbers, another child working on the quantities, another child working on teams. And so a lot of the times when these new lessons are being introduced, it's a lot of one on one. There are group lessons in a Montessori classroom. There might be um, two children working on the same activity because they're, um, they're at the same stage developmentally. Um, but just making sure that we're having these individualized lessons um, is a really crucial component within the Montessori philosophy. And so in the classroom, you know, just recognizing that students have different abilities, prior knowledge and learning processes. So just tailoring the way that you're teaching these lessons to accommodate these differences, offer very learning materials and activities, including options for advanced learners and additional support for struggling students. So, you know, one thing, um, right now in, in the classroom that we have is that, you know, some students, you know, are still learning how to trace, right? But we already have students that are already tracing, or we might have students that are already writing. So obviously, you know, we're going to give the student who is tracing, you know, tracing paper, a student that's not yet there, you're still going to help them with that pincer grip and making sure that they're writing the pencil properly. And in order for them to gain those muscles, you know, we want to make sure that we're giving them fine motor activities to help um, build those muscles in their hand. So they are able, so they're able to hold the pencil properly. Um, and so, and then we have another child who's writing. So obviously they're gonna go ahead and start writing. Um, so these children are on different levels. So just making sure that we're aware of that and that we're giving them appropriate lessons um, to tailor to what they already know. Cause not every child is the same and not every child learning the same. Even in classrooms that might only have three-year-olds. You know, you might have a child who um, is a little bit more advanced than the other students. So just making sure that we're, we're challenging them and giving them extensions of uh, materials um, because they, they need it. They need um, more of a challenge. So just being more aware of things like that. Um, freedom of movement and choice is a huge one in Montessori. Um, and so Maria Montessori observed that children learn best when they are free to move, free to choose their own work and follow their interests. In a Montessori classroom, children are free to move around a prepared environment, which we'll talk about more of, uh, work where, where they feel they will learn best and discover learning outcomes through hands-on experience. Montessori learning is largely active, individually paced, often self-correcting and tailored to the needs and interests of each child. And so within a Montessori classroom, as you can see in the photo, um, it's very organized. There's enough space for children to walk around. Um, we have some children here, looks like they might have be eating snack. We have a child over here working on an activity. We have children over here, child here, and children over there. So they're all spaced out. They're all doing their own thing. And so that's really what Montessori and a Montessori classroom is all about, is them being able to move around freely and them choosing whatever material they want to work on. And, um, you know, and so we can implement some of this into, the, into your classrooms as well. And so one example is individual work bins or trays. So preparing these trays or work bins with age appropriate tasks or activities that preschoolers can select and complete independently. Rotate the contents of the bins to keep them engaged and aligned with children's interests. So for going back to this page, um, on the shelves, you see there's individual trays, baskets of activities, you know, a whole bunch of different things. They're well organized. They're not just thrown clutter. They're not all in a toy box. It's very organized and neat. And the idea is for the child and what the child, the children do, they go, they grab the activity, take it to either the table or on the floor with the rug. They do the activity and they put it right back where it was, right back where they got it from. And so maybe having trays like this or maybe having baskets in your classroom, making it easy, easily accessible for the children to grab um, could be beneficial. And also open layout. Right. Design the classroom with an open layout, allowing children to move freely between different activity centers or um, shelves. Use low shelves and clear pathways to, to facilitate movement. Set up various activity centers, such as a reading library, art area, sensory table, um, building corner. Each center should offer a range of materials and activities. So again, you know, just going, sorry, going back and forth to this picture, but just showing you like the shelves is down to the child's level easily for them to access the activities and taking them to the table. They're not high up 
where they can't reach it because then they're obviously won't be able to move around freely and choose what they're what they want to work on everything is down to their level and they're able to take and, and bring whatever they want to work on to the table or to the rug and so the next principle intrinsic motivation so the Montessori approach takes the view that learning is its own reward. In the Montessori classroom, there aren't any gold stars to reward children's learning. Instead, children derive a sense of accomplishment from completing an activity and learning to do it themselves. So in a Montessori classroom, there aren't gold stickers, there aren't stamps, there aren't treasure boxes um, for completing an activity. You know, they get, they have their own reward when they are able to complete the activity on their own, when they are able to um, overcome the struggle that they have to complete that activity. You know, so you see this child's face, he's so happy he did this work, you know, and this could be a challenging work for a child. Um, and so just that is the reward itself. You know, we don't need all these extra um, stars and stickers and things like that. I mean, they're cute, they're nice, um, but not to reward them for, you know, completing a task. They're already feeling the accomplishment themselves. And so, um, for your classrooms, promote mastery and competence. Create a classroom environment where students can experience a sense of accomplishment and mastery. Scaffold lessons so that they gradually build on prior knowledge and skills. So, you know, it may take time for students to develop a strong sense of intrinsic motivation, but with consistent effort and the right classroom culture, it can become a powerful driving force in their education. So, you know, providing activities that they're able to complete on their own and master on their own in order to, they need to have these different activities to complete in order to feel that sense of accomplishment and to feel that sense of rewardness. So making sure that we offer these things to them um, can be able to um, provide this intrinsic motivation. Independence, independence is a big one in our Montessori classroom. Um, if, this is another quote from Maria Montessori. If teaching is to be effective with young children, it must assist them to, add, to advance on the way to independence. And so Montessori is an education for independence. Everything that we do in a Montessori classroom, everything that's done is really for them to be independent. And so it provides children with environment materials and guidance to learn to do and think for themselves. It views children as born learners who are capable and willing to teach themselves when provided with the right stimulus. The ultimate goal of Montessori education is independence. And so all the materials, especially the practical life um, area, which we'll talk about more, really helps them into building this independence. And so going back to the freedom of movement and choice, that's also to help build independence. So a lot of these principles kind of intertwine with each other and they kind of sound very similar. Um, it's because it's all part of um, building independence for each child. And so what we can do, you know, personal cubbies, something simple as that, personal cubbies or a personal bin, you know, assign each student with a personal cubby or bin where they can store their belongings, you know, such as backpacks, supplies, water bottles, lunchbox. Um, so like, for example, you know, okay, it's lunchtime, everybody, let's go to our cubbies and let's go grab our lunch boxes. So they go to their cubby, they grab their lunch boxes, they go inside the classroom, they open their lunch boxes by themselves, take out everything, eat their lunch, and they clean up everything by themselves and they put it back in their cubby. Okay, friends, it's time for nap time. Let's go get our sleeping things. They go to their cubby, they grab their sleeping things, they put it on the cot. They might need a little bit of help, you know, opening their sheets and everything or nap rolls. But then after nap time, they roll it back up and they put it back in their cubbies. And so, you know, making sure that the cubbies, yes, the cubby should have names on it, but a lot of children might not be able to identify their name right yet. Right yet. So maybe include a picture in that too. So they're able to see, oh, that's me, that's my cubby. My things go in there um, would be helpful for them too. And so this will teach children how to locate, manage their own cubbies and fostering a sense of responsibility and obviously independence. Self-help skills. Encourage the development of self-help skills such as putting on, taking off jackets, shoes, backpacks independently. Now, a lot of the time, I feel that this is more of a parent issue <laughs> where the parents are doing everything for the kids. The parents are, I know sometimes at my job, you know, the parents are taking off their shoes, the parents are taking off their backpacks and putting in their cubbies. It's like, no, 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 let them do it. They are more than capable in doing it. It's just, I think for parents, it's patient, you know, especially um, you're trying to get to school, you're trying to hurry up and get out of the house and I'll just do it, I'll just do it, I'll just do it for you. But, you know, in the classroom, just giving them time, giving them time um, during the transition 
to do things on their own and self-help, especially potty training. Potty training is a huge self-help skill that children will develop. So for example, in a Montessori classroom, even in um, my classroom that, I, that I'm at at BUMO, um, we don't change children laying down. They change themselves standing up and we start at age two. And so we encourage them to take off their own pants, take off their own pull-up, put it in the trash. We encourage them to sit on the potty. A lot of the time we'll get tears and they don't want to, which is fine. We're not going to force them. Um, but we encourage them to sit on the potty. And then when they're done, they put on their own pull-up and their own pants. You know, we want them to build independence. We want them to develop these self-help skills. And so that's really where the big one is, is potty training. And so encouraging that. If they're laying down, you know, how are they able to help themselves? So we, that's why that's why we really have them standing up is so they can do it on themselves. Obviously, we're there to help when the help is needed. Because a lot of the time, parents are putting skinny jeans and belts on, and so they need that extra support. Um, but, you know, and so we really want to help them. And so that's why we encourage parents to make sure they have baggy, loose clothes. So they're able to do it on their own. Same with shoes, you know. A lot of time they come in with these fancy shoes, with all these laces and buttons and everything and buckles. And, you know, they're not able to do that just yet. They're still learning how to get their foot in the shoe. So, you know, just encouraging Velcro, easy slip on shoes for them to do it on their own um, is really helpful and beneficial for them. And the prepared environment. So this is a big one. And this prepared environment helps with building independence and self-help skills too. And so the Montessori classroom is also known as a prepared environment. This is a carefully prepared learning space where everything has a purpose and a place. The fundamental idea is order and environment and mind. Within this space, children are free to follow their interests, choose their work and progress at their own pace. So this is a Montessori classroom. It's beautiful. Um, you know, it has real plants. Montessori, another thing about Montessori is that everything should be real. We don't want fake. Um, so you won't see fake plants in a Montessori classroom. Um, and also fantasy, they don't believe in fantasy. So you won't see a mural with Mickey Mouse or a mural with Donald Duck or whatever. You won't see that because it's not real. Um, and so everything is real in a Montessori classroom. Even, you know, you see these pictures and bowl, they're real. And a lot of time we also have glass items in a Montessori classroom because they're real and they're practical. You're going to see that in your everyday life. So why not go ahead and introduce that to them now? And so also in the classroom, you know, it's very neutral, right? It's very neutral. It's very calm. It's very inviting. Like, I want to go in that classroom and work. You know, it's very beautiful. Um, the colors are very calm and neutral and just gorgeous. And in a Montessori classroom, you know, we don't see the bright yellows, the bright reds, the bright blues, the primary colors, because it can be a little overstimulating. And sometimes for children, it might be hard for them to focus with all the brightness around them. You know, they're so distracted by everything else that's around them that they're not focusing on the activity that they're doing. Not saying that, you know, the brightness colors aren't beautiful, you know, they're gorgeous. Um, but just I'm just saying for Montessori, you know, um, that's we won't see that in a Montessori classroom. You might see real photos on the wall. A lot of the time we'll ask families to bring in photos of themselves and we'll post them on the wall. We might have a photo of Maria Montessori on the wall with a nice quote that she has. But that's pretty much all you'll see. And you might see some artwork, too, on the wall for the children. And when artwork is displayed on the wall, it should be um, displayed lower to their eye level just so they can see it and appreciate it as well. And so going back, you know, a uh, prepared environment is the hallmark of the Montessori classroom. Um, it's particularly prepared. Um, you know, everything is ready to go when children walk in the room. You know, all the, all the pencils are sharpened. They're, all of the towels are there when they need to clean up their mess. They're already there. Everything's already there, ready to go. So when children are there, it's all set to go. It's not children come, oh, wait, I forgot to get this. Oh, wait, I forgot to get that. You know, no, it's already prepared in advance for them. Um, desk and chairs are replaced with child-sized tables and chairs, inviting collaboration and independence. Materials are carefully curated to facilitate hands-on learning. And again, you don't need to recreate the entire classroom, but just consider how your space can be organized to encourage exploration and self-directed learning. And so some other ways where you can create a Montessori inspired classroom, again, just arranging the classroom to be clean, orderly, and visually appealing, use child side furniture and materials. So you see this, this classroom here, you know, it's children are easily able to move around, get to one area to the next area. It's laid out very nicely. 
Um, it's not cluttered, it's not dirty, um, it's organized and it has the different areas within the classroom. You know, and so clearly defining the areas in your um, classroom, such as practical life, sensorial, math, language, cultural, these are Montessori, I'm not saying include those, but you know, just having your separate areas, have your dramatic play area over here, have your block area over here, instead of having dramatic and block together, just have it separate, you know, it will be easy for them. Displaying materials on open shelves on the child's eye level, making them accessible for independent exploration and use. So, you know, having these shelves, I love a good shelf, um, having these shelves there to their eye level makes it easy to display the activities, you know, on the trays like we talked about or bins or baskets. And it makes them easy to, to be seen and for them to grab and take whatever they want or whatever um, is their interest at that moment in time. And so those were the principles, it's a lot, it's a lot of information. Um, don't worry, you will get these slides at the end too, because I might be talking too fast and not realize it. So I apologize if I am, but um, going into the Montessori curriculum. So the Montessori curriculum has five areas of learning. It has practical life, sensorial, language, math, culture. And so in the classroom, the classrooms are divided into these different areas. And so practical life, practical life is my favorite. Um, the practical life area provides a foundation for all other activities in a Montessori classroom. Fulfilling the child's plea, help me do it myself. Um, through exercises and daily living, such as pouring and scrubbing and sewing, um, gardening, or practicing grace and courtesy, the child gains confidence and mastery of the environment. After individual skills are refined, children apply them in purposeful work, such as serving juice or polishing. So this will be a practical life activity. And you see that this is glass. We use glass materials in the classroom. And it's okay if they break, you know, we tell them that's okay, that happens. I'm sure they have glass at home that breaks sometimes, you know, you, you just have to be careful. And so when they see that it's broken and you express that it's okay, just be careful, then they tend to remember that and they go very slowly next time because they don't break it. You know, so they're already learning from their mistakes. And so a simple activity just as pouring juice we have in the classroom, you know, during snack time in a Montessori classroom for our preschool age, they serve themselves snacks, you know, they don't all sit together for snack time, they, they have snack when they're ready for a snack and that's going back to respecting the child. When it's, let's say, you know, everybody's down for snack, but what if that child's not hungry yet? Or what if that child had a big breakfast and they're not ready for snack? You know, we're not, it's, it's not fair to ask them to have snack if they're not hungry at that moment, but maybe 30 minutes later, they might be hungry. And so they can go ahead and have their snack when they're, when they want snack. And so that's kind of how Montessori is, um, ran, is ran. And that's also when we talk about respecting the child, that's one way we do is just when they're ready to eat snack. And so how we can apply practical life in your classroom. So these are just some examples of what we have in a Montessori classroom, you know, this child here is scrubbing the table. You know, they love to clean. <laughs> they, they might not like to clean up the material and toys, but when you bring water or a sponge, they're all for it. So they love scrubbing the table. They love cleaning with water. And so, you know, that's one activity that you can easily do. Watering plants, you know, making sure that we have real plants in the classroom and telling them we need to take care of our environment, you know, and one way that we do that is watering plants. And so, um, having a little um, pitcher next to it, you know, they can water the plant. And these are some other just simple activities that we um, consider practical life, you know, just something as easy as putting a pillowcase on a pillow, you know, that's practical. That's fun. They like, they like it. They love it. Um, sorting socks. So, you know, we sort bees and we sort big teddy bears and we sort all these other things, but what about socks? You know, we can sort socks by color, by design. Eventually when they get older, you know, and they start doing laundry, they're going to have to sort socks. <laughs> you know, it's not the best, not the funnest, but as a child, they love doing it. You know, they, they probably make sock puppets out of their hands. But that's okay. You know, they're exploring, they're learning, they're having fun. Um, another one is cleaning glasses, you know, using a, um, a small bottle um, to clean glasses. And that's good for fine motor skills as well. And you, this can go on and on and on. You can do so many different things. And so be creative, you know, be creative. And also our practical life area does get switched off every month to keep it fresh and new for the children. But also if you see that you put out an activity and it's just been sitting there and collecting dust and the child is not interested in, no one's touched it for like a week, just remove it. Just take it out of there and replace it with something else that might catch their interest. Um, sensorial. So um, 
for sensorial, you know, it revolves around all the senses, you know, sight, sound, taste, all of them, right? And so Maria Montessori developed different types of sensorial materials to help explore and develop those senses. And so in her classroom, this is a Montessori traditional shelf here. Um, and so in the classroom, you know, she has all these materials to help with these senses. So we have colors, um, we have to match colors, we have seriation. She has sound, um, sound boxes. So in these little sound cylinders, there's different materials in them. And so they shake them and they have to find the ones that match with the same sound. She has smell bottles. So within the smell bottles, there's different items inside. There might be cinnamon, there might be nutmeg in it and they have to smell it and see what they think it is. Um, taste bottles, they might have lemon juice in it or honey in it for them to taste these different things. You know, the list goes on and on about all different materials that, that they have in the classroom. And so not saying that you need to go out and get Montessori materials, but saying that you can incorporate this into your classroom, just making it yours and making it, um, you know, this, making it yours, but also remembering the sense as well that you're trying to have them learn. And so these are non, not really Montessori. Um, this has a little bit of, they have the brown stairs and the knob cylinders. So they're traditional Montessori materials and the sound, but everything else is not, but that's okay. You know, you can incorporate that in your classroom. They have the colors, you know, the rainbow, which is also seriation. They have puzzles and things like that that you can incorporate. And this little one, I think this is for a toddler classroom, also has a couple of things as well that you can incorporate. And so language, you know, language is another big one um, in Montessori and we have tons of different Montessori, um, uh, Montessori objects and materials in the classroom to help with language. And, you know, language might not just be, you know, for a two-year-old, they're not gonna do the mobile alphabet yet. So just reading a story, having puppets, doing a felt board, you know, can help with, um, with language. And also with language, you know, for Montessori, when we teach the alphabet, you know, we don't teach A, B, C, D, we teach the sounds first. So we go, ah, the, the. Cause that's gonna help them when it comes to reading and then they already know the sound. So when they put the sounds together, they're able to you know, create the word and start reading. So that's how we introduce the letters to students. And so in a Montessori classroom, you know, we have this is your traditional Montessori um, area and shelves. And so, but for you, obviously we're, we're not saying to go ahead and buy all this stuff, but just have a library, you know, available in the classroom, have a cozy little um, area with books for them to at least look at and read. I think a lot of the time now, you know, they're so into screens and reading off screens and tablets and phones, you know, so just getting rid of the screens and just making sure that we're having real books in the classroom for them to um, discover and explore, I think is really important. This shelf here is not a Montessori shelf, but it has rhyming puzzles, it has an alphabet puzzle, it has a chalkboard for them to do penmanship, you know, just simple things like this. And it's a whole separate area, you know, again, just making sure we're separating these items into its own little area or its own little shelf is important and an easy way for you to do in the classroom. Math, um, math is fun. Again, like I mentioned in math, you know, it's a sequence to where, um, and, and all the all the shelves in the Montessori classroom, you know, start with the basic and you work your way up to more challenging work. And so this is an example of sandpaper numbers. The numbers have that sandpaper material for them to help trace, um, trace and making sure that they're aware of the how the numbers are going for when it's time to write it down on paper. And in a traditional Montessori classroom, this is kind of what a shelf will look like. This is just one shelf and there's other shelves for the math section. Um, but for your class, you know, chicka chicka boom boom, you know, numbers, counting. Um, looks like this is really cute down here. It looks like someone made like with a muffin tin um, and put numbers inside. And so they just um, put them on a number or amount of buttons that go with that number um, for quantity. That's a cute um, activity that you can apply in your classroom. Um, looks like uh, cubes might be there, some other little manipulatives mil that you can count, a little weighing section here. Um, you know, so you can incorporate math in many different ways. And just, again, just making sure that it is separate from everything else in all the areas in the classroom. Cultural, cultural and Montessori can mean, uh, it includes arts, music, geography, zoology, botany, that's all, um, all under cultural. And in your cultural classroom in a Montessori, you know, this is kind of what the shelf will look like. We have, um, they're very keen on the continents. So they're always learning the continents. So they have their own 
area here where they're puzzles. So we start with the world and then we go on to each continent. Um, and then all the flags, all of the land and water forms here, it looks like outer spaces down here. And then this would be a zoology um, area where they talk about different creatures. And so this looks like the curriculum was all about frogs. And so, you know, you can have a shelf full of maybe penguins or horses or whatever, and just have different activities relating to that, the life cycle of a frog. It looks like they have the anatomy of a frog and different puzzles as well. And then obviously incorporating culture. Um, you know, actually today is um, the first day of Hispanic Heritage Month. And so they have, looks like they might have a shelf either um, consider with Cinco de Mayo or the Hispanic Heritage. It's obviously super cute, you know, having an area focusing on that heritage and making sure you switch it out and remembering what, you know, what's coming up for Black History Month. They might, you know, have that area full of different items representing that. And so it looks like they have sensorial, so music, they hear the maracas, practical life, they're pouring, they have math over here, some art, um, some language with the book. So they have like all in one um, almost, and that's super cute, but it's all related to the same um, culture. And so that's my webinar. <laughs> Um, I hope you, that was very informative for you guys. And so I have um, a little q and A. I did receive some questions prior and um, yeah, I'm glad you guys loved it. <laughs> um, and so I have a couple questions that some, um, some people had asked and sent prior. So we'll go ahead and answer those guys. Let me just get some water because my mouth. <laughs> so this is a good question. Actually, they're all really good questions. So. If children are left to choose their own activities, won't they just do the same thing every day or end up doing nothing? Um, so no, um, teachers in a Montessori classroom, you know, are highly trained on um, observant, you know, that's another thing, observation. That's why I keep bringing it up because it's so important, you know, making sure we're watching the kids. And if we do see a child kind of wandering around, not, not choosing an activity, kind of going from one area to the next. Um, you know, then we'll go up to that child and encourage them say, hi, what should we work on today? Do you want to work on this puzzle? I know you like space. I have these space cards or whatever it is, you know, I have these space cards. Do you want to work on that? And just really trying to get them to, um, to grab to an activity that they're interested in. And so when a child has mastered a skill, though, the teacher will give the child a lesson that is more challenging. So let's say, you know, the child completed whatever that activity is now. and so you want to and um, you want to show them that okay so you did that so now let's move on to this let's do this let's do this activity now and make it more fun and so since the environment is so stimulating and exciting children seldom just don't do anything you know they someone is doing that um you know cleaning the table there's so much happening in the classroom and so much activity and so much things that we're offering in the classroom children really rarely don't do anything but for those children who just might have a bad day or just might not be into it that day which happens you know it's always okay to go up to them and approach them and say hey what are you interested what do you want to do instead of being like hey let's do this today you know let them be able to tell you what they want to do express what they want to do and that's going back to you know freedom of movement and choice, you know, let them tell you what they want instead of saying, let's do this, we're gonna do this, we're all doing this, you know, let, let them be able to tell you. So no. <laughs> um, the next question was, where are toys? So um, that's, you know, that's a good question. But so Montessori classroom, obviously are not like your traditional classroom. You're not gonna see the dramatic play area. You're not gonna see the block core and you're not gonna see trucks everywhere. And so the Montessori philosophy extends the materials in the classroom. So the Montessori materials, right? And so you may not see children playing cards or any of that, but instead you might see a child, you know, scrubbing the table. You might see a child um, uh, washing their hands or cleaning the dishes or sweeping or, you know, doing the practical life pouring or even, some children use actual needles to sew. And so for Maria Montessori, and so when you see children in a Montessori classroom, they're working, we call it work. They're working on an activity, they're working. And so work means play, but instead of saying play, we just say work. And so children are playing um, with these different materials and they enjoy it, they like doing it. They like handling it and fixing it. Um, and so that's their way of playing is using those materials and doing the work in the classroom. Um, is it true that Montessori children never play? And so going back to the toys, you know, um, and so even though that these toys that they have, 
um, are in the classroom. They're, they're not the toys, right? They're the materials. And so it relates to the play. They are playing with the materials. They are working with the materials. You know, her Montessori's vision was to combine play with learning and, and satisfy a child's curiosity while still allowing them to have fun. So a lot of the time people say, oh, Montessori is so strict. Oh, they're not having fun. The kids look, you know, they're playing with these random materials. But in reality, they actually are. They really enjoy it. And so if you've ever been to a Montessori classroom, you know, um, in a traditional one, it's very calm. And children are just around, moving around, doing what they want to do. And it's very quiet and it's calm. And it's not just, it's not, a, it's not a lot happening. And that's because they're really enjoying what they're doing. They actually like what they're doing. They're having a good time. They're learning from it. And so that's their way of playing is with the materials in the classroom. So they do play. <laughs> and then why are materials, Montessori materials so expensive? <laughs> they are expensive, I know, not fair, but a lot of the time when you see Montessori materials, they're wood. And so wood materials are obviously more expensive than your plastic materials. Also wood materials, these materials are not really um, mass produced. They're, you know, sometimes they're per order um, and they run out a lot of the time because they're handmade and they're beautiful materials you know, and they're very durable. They're really good quality. So they can last a long time and they're a really good investment. And so when I was working at the Montefiore School, um, you know, they had materials from like, they were 10 years old, but they still looked amazing. They still did its job. They still were beautiful. You know, obviously if a material is missing, um, Obviously, if a material is missing, then, you know, we will have to remove it and replace it with something else. But, um, you know, they're designed to be beautiful. Children, again, children appreciate beauty. They love beautiful things just as much as we do. And so, you know, I know that they're expensive. So some ways that you can incorporate Montessori materials in your classroom and how to save money is by use. You know, like I said, since they're very durable and um, they're very sturdy and they last a long time, a lot of the time when we get used ones, they're still in great shape. They're still amazing shape. So if you want to go on to, um, you know, some of these secondhand stores, they might offer them. Or even if you have offer up, you know, a lot of the time if a Montessori school is closing, you know, that'll be a great time to grab some material and stock up on them. Um, a lot of the time we make our own, not necessarily the wooden materials, but like the cards, you know, honestly, just get that white card stock, print them, laminate them, and boom, you have Montessori three-part cards. So you can easily go ahead and make your own cards too. Or you could do like a material swap, you know, maybe a school has an overload on a certain material and say, hey, you know, I have a lot of Play-Doh. Can I switch you with, you know, some of your materials? And you can do something like that too. Um, but I know they're expensive and I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so that is all I have. Um, we will, again, we will be sending you these slides. Uh, we'll, I'll be sending a blog shortly, um, just going back to what was talked today and include the slides. Um, we also be sending a newsletter. We're going to have a group chat soon as well. So keep your eyes out for that. And then we also have our next webinar, 10 key success strategies for giving a tour that leads to enrollment. You know, obviously, for tours, you know, you want to make sure that you're um, conducting it appropriately in order to gain that parent's interest. Um, and you want to get them in, you want to get them in the school. So we're going to talk about that. And so for if you already have questions regarding tours and enrollment, please go ahead and email me. Um, my email address is there. And then um, I will get those answers to you. And thank you all for coming. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so happy that you all were here. <laughs>